Hi, good afternoon and welcome to our October event. Uh, my name is Chad Davis and I'm the president of the Polk County Lawyers Chapter of the Federal Society. And uh, we are so glad to have everyone here today for our event on government mandated vaccine requirements, OSHA, Jacobson and the legacy of Buck v. Bell, featuring our guest speaker, Professor Todd Zawicki. If this is your first time participating in a society event, welcome. The Federal Society is a national organization of 40,000 lawyers, law students, scholars, and other individuals who are interested in the current state of the legal order. While the Federal Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy questions, it is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Today, I wanna to emphasize that any positions taken on specific legal or political issues are those of the speakers and do not reflect an organization's stance. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Professor Todd Zawicki is a George Mason University Foundation Professor of Law at Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University and a senior fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. He is also a senior fellow of the F.A. Hayek Program for the Advanced Study of Politics, Philosophy and Economics at George Mason University. He has taught at Vanderbilt University Law School, Georgetown University Law Center, Boston College Law School, Mississippi College School of Law, and China University of Political Science and Law. Professor Zawicki holds a JD from the University of Virginia, a MA in Economics from Clemson University, and an AB cum laude with high honors from Dartmouth College. Professor Zawicki recently sued George Mason University over its vaccine mandate and succeeded in getting a medical exemption. We are very fortunate to have him join us today to share with us about his experiences and to shed some light on the current situation of the employer vaccine mandates under the order from the Biden administration in accordance with the legacy of immunization jurisprudence. If you have any questions, please submit them during Professor Zawicki's presentation. And now Professor Zawicki, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chad. And it's great to be with uh, all of you guys. It's particularly uh, pleasant to be speaking with a Florida chapter. Um, as, uh, Florida has really led the way, I think, in um, science-based approaches to all of this. And um, I was particularly impressed when Governor DeSantis uh, picked uh, the great uh, Dr. Joe Ladapo as your new uh, state surgeon general, uh, who has been um, very clear-headed about this all through the uh, all through this entire process. And so it's um, it's fun to be um, to be interacting with you guys today, and I look forward to talking to you um, and answering your questions. So. Um, as Chad noted, um, these obviously views are my own, uh, but they arose. Uh, you know, I was this wasn't originally something I was planning on doing, but um, but this arose from a lawsuit that I brought against my employer this spring um, when they issued a vaccine mandate. And what I'm going to do during my talk is I'm going to really use natural immunity, which is my case, as a case study of how we can approach vaccine mandates from a science-based perspective. Um, and also to illustrate the point of why it's important for judges to actually step up on this uh, and why the, the long and sordid history of involuntary medical procedures in the United States uh, makes it clear that judges cannot just stand on the sidelines while these uh, mandates are issued. Um, and then in the end, I'm going to talk about some discrete problems uh, with respect to these mandates, both from the perspective of state mandates and powers, um, as well as the looming OSHA mandate and uh, why that is probably illegal uh, um, as well in terms of the powers that the federal government um, has. So I'm going to um, do a, um, um, uh, let's see, I, oh, I was going to share my screen. I think the host needs to uh, enable me to uh, uh, share my screen. So I'm not sure if that's Chad or Abby. I also want to make clear I will make these slides available. I'll send them to the uh, Federal Society when I'm done today. If people want to um, to uh, to to download uh, download them and view them yourself, um, can I? Is Chad or Abby? Can one of you allow me to share my screen? Whoever um, whoever's uh, listed, she's working on it. All right, thank you. We practiced at the beginning, but we didn't practice uh, making me the host. Huh? There you go. Uh, let's see. Okay, and um, let's, uh, let's see. Let's 
see how do I I gotta find the um oh great let's see there you go all right uh I assume everybody can see this now so um all right um so uh, uh so a lot of the debate over this issue has come back to the, uh, the famous or infamous case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts. These are some of the lines that have come out of this uh, case. And um, early on, this became the um, controlling um, precedent with respect to um, how, how judges would go about um, approaching this. And one of the first things that's um, notable about Jacobson, of course, is it's a 1905 case. Uh, this is a very old case. This is 1905 ethics. This is 1905 medicine. Uh, which was obviously very crude and rudimentary, uh, opposed to what we have uh, now, as we'll see later, for example, it was impossible, things like antibody tests and um, the ways of confirming um, prior um, immunity um, did not exist at that time. But Jacobson is also notable because 1905 was notable for another reason, which is literally three days after Jacobson was decided, the uh, Supreme Court heard arguments in Lochner. Um, and so as we're reading Jacobson, what we have to understand is that while the court here um, used some loose language with respect to Jacobson, they clearly did not mean Jacobson to mean anything goes uh, with respect to the police power, because as we know, Lochner was decided soon thereafter um, as a restraint on the police power quite overtly. And what we see in Jacobson um, as a jumping off point is that regulations must be reasonable, um, that the local government must be acting under the state of state, uh, sanction of state legislation, um, and they cannot uh, infringe on any constitutional uh, or right, even acknowledge police power of the state. Um, and the other thing that's quite striking about, um, about Jacobson is the, the uh, unlike losing your job, uh, which our current jobs do, uh, the, the current mandates would have you do, what ended up in Jacobson was he was required to pay a $5 fine if he did not get vaccinated under the Cambridge law there, which is uh, $155 uh, today. So as I said, what I'm going to do is talk about um, uh, these vaccines first, uh, and then I'm going to use natural immunity as a case study of how um, uh, courts can think about this and how courts can, under the logic of Jacobson, make sure that um, what actually happens with respect to these mandates is reasonable um, and uh, adequately protects people's constitutional rights um, while at the same time uh, pres presenting uh, um, potentially reasonable um, uh, efforts to, provide, to protect public uh, health. First thing to note about these vaccines is we've learned a lot of these, about these so-called vaccines as they, as they have come out, um, which is, as you see in this uh, paper in toxicology reports, um, it's not even clear that this is necessarily um, a, uh, an accurate term to call them vaccines as opposed to inoculation um, because of the nature of these vaccines. These are non-sterilizing, non-durable, and narrowly targeted against non-extinct variant of a mutable virus. Um, and even according to the CDC, they're effective you at uh, primarily effective at preventing against severe illness and death, um, providing limited infection against uh, protection against infection, um, and particularly limited sterilizing uh, infection, even where uh, they've measured against protection, it's usually against symptomatic infection, um, not um, infection generally. We also know that um, uh, the risk is stratified, uh, which is that those, it continues to be the case that 95% uh, of those who die um, from COVID uh, have uh, multiple comorbidities. Most of those who are hospitalized have multiple uh, comorbidities. And so we're talking about a disease that we've known from the beginning and still remains the case um, is much riskier to identifiable elements of the population, much less risk uh, to, uh, to, to others. Um, so let's talk about natural immunity. It affects about 120 million people. Um, the efficacy in about 20 different studies now, this is just a list of some of the countries and places where we've had these, finds that natural immunity applies, uh, um, is at least as effective as the uh, most effective vaccines, at least seem to be at first, uh, being the mRNA. Uh, vaccines, 90 to 95% uh, efficacy. Um, and there's a couple now of, um, there's a couple um, uh, um, um, meta-analyses. Uh, one, uh, Chavese was a, uh, um, at L, was a study of 12 million individuals. Um, and they found that 90% of people still had um, immunological memory to SARS-CoV-2 uh, for at least six to eight months, uh, very low risk of reinfection. 
Merchu did a meta-analysis of 615,000 individuals, finding a very low reinfection rate, a very uh, uh, with no study reporting an increase in the, uh, in the reinfection rate uh, over time. Um, they find that the uh, um, uh, that, that that at least for seven months, um, and probably for at least ten months, uh, which of course compares very favorably to the vaccines, which as we will see, basically um, uh, their protection wanes within almost completely within about six months for uh, for several of them. This is a, a chart from the Cleveland Clinic study, uh, which uh, looked at healthcare workers, and so this is a particularly useful study. Um, when it uh, when it came out, um, and for various reasons, it's um, it apparently for, for unclear reasons, it's not uh, it was retracted or something. But you can see what the data here was, uh, which is that uh, um, that those who um, were um, infected, this were healthcare workers. And so, what's useful about this is, unlike some of the other studies, this was a, a group that was subject to routine testing and not self selected testing, which becomes a problem in some of these, especially with vaccines. What we see here is that those who were vaccinated, those who were not, um, who were infected and not vaccinated, and those who were previously infected and vaccinated, all had zero um, events of reoccurrence uh, during uh, during this uh, period uh, that the, um, under which the Cleveland Clinic was uh, studying this. Um, What's uh, so so the vaccine so natural immunity is quite clearly just as um, protective as the most protective vaccines and as we'll see it also is uh, more durable as it, it turns out but even more important um, and sort of you know kind of going to the point about what's going on with these vaccines is that it's clearly more important or, or more protective than somewhat mediocre vaccines so the Janssen vaccine for example J and J was originally, even in the clinical trials, only about 66% uh, protective compared to 90 to 95% protective for, uh, for natural immunity um, based on that. Um, the, the George Mason one uh, uh, in several universities are this, it's actually um, almost hard to believe, but the George Mason policy um, treated you as vaccinated if you had been vaccinated with any vaccine um, that was approved by the World Health Organization, uh, which included, among others, the Chinese vaccines uh, such as Sinovac and Sinopharm um, and AstraZeneca, all of which aren't even approved under the, uh, the FDA. Uh, now, whatever is going on there, it's hard to justify that as being uh, explained by, um, by protecting community health. Um, I don't know about you, but if a student comes rolling in, uh, you know, six months after they've gotten the Sinovac vaccine, I'm not exactly feeling uh, super, uh, super safe against this. Um, was it, um, uh, which leads to a suggestion, maybe, um, maybe it was, uh, had something to do with um, a desire to have, make sure Chinese students could attend um, uh, schools. Uh, a lot of universities have this, uh, protecting the, uh, the WHO vaccines. Whatever is going on, it's hard to justify it as being something that um, is re reasonably calculated to protect public health, uh, and this is fairly uh, widespread. Um, it's not clear whether the federal the federal um, rules so far as applied to contractors apparently do not recognize the WHO vaccines, but a lot of them uh, a lot of them do. These are all the studies I've been able to find um, that shows that vaccine provides um, uh, uh, actually uh, clinical evidence that vaccines uh, provide a more protection than uh, natural immunity uh, against, uh, against reinfection. Uh, they literally do not exist. Um, when you ask people for evidence of this, it literally does not exist. Um, it's often asserted, but, uh, but there, I have not been able to find any studies. Um, if somebody knows of a study that shows, for example, that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine after one shot uh, provides more protection than natural immunity, I would be interested in seeing it. Um, to the best of my knowledge, that does not exist. Um, and so um, the scientific basis for claiming that vaccines are more protective than natural immunity, especially vaccines that provide less protection like the Johnson & Johnson um, uh, did, um, uh, and the WHO vaccines um, just simply do not exist. And so there seems to be no basis in, uh, in any clinical findings uh, for, that, uh, for that conclusion. Uh, the other thing that we've learned about the vaccines, of course, is that protection wanes very dramatically over time. Um, and, um, and there's been a number of studies that have found this now. And so now we're in this kind of ironic um, situation in which what we are seeing is a claim that uh, um, 
uh, that we both simultaneously um, that the vaccines work and that we all have to get booster shots. Um, and we know why we have to get booster shots uh, now, which is that for whatever reason, the vaccines do not provide uh, as durable protection. Uh, and this was one notable study that found that antibody titers uh, with respect to those who are vaccinated uh, decreased by about 40% a month versus those uh, with natural immunity decreases by less than 5% uh, a month, such that within uh, six months, this is one study uh, that they basically had um, um, uh, no discernible antibodies for about 16% of subjects. Um, and um, uh, as opposed to nine months later, a, a, a smaller number of those with natural immunity. So we see a substantial uh, decrease in the protection provided by the vaccines, as we all know, after about six months. Uh, this is a study of Qatar, um, which looked at um, the effectiveness and found by 20 to 24 weeks, there was uh, uh, literally no um, effective protection against asymptomatic um, uh, infection. Um, in, uh, um, and after 25 weeks uh, with respect to symptomatic uh, in infection. Now, this is one of the more extreme findings, but, uh, but it's a relatively large database um, uh, that, um, was, uh, uh, that was used in, um, in the Qatar study um, and um, in a pretty systematic way of doing it. So what we see is pretty dramatic uh, waning. This is a chart that many of you may have seen by now. This is what um, caused the United States to, uh, to panic about boosters. Uh, this was um, data that came out of Israel uh, this summer. Um, and what we see uh, here was that by, uh, for those, this was done in July and they found that those who were vaccinated in January um, had a 16% uh, protection against infection. Um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, and then 16% protection against symptomatic infection. And as you probably know, um, uh, all of Israel was vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine. Um, now, why does the United States have to rely so much on data from Israel? Well, it turns out for some reason, um, the, um, the United States stopped collecting data on uh, uh, breakthrough infections on May 1st, um, which as we will see um, somewhat coincidentally, turned out to be exactly the date at which uh, um, breakthrough infections started rising in the United States. So, um, uh, so you know, there, there, there you have it. Uh, but that is uh, when, they, um, when they ended up um, uh, doing it in the, uh, in the United States. Um, this, is, um, uh, a more, this is recent data that came out just the other day uh, that finds that uh, this is uh, the decline in protection from, uh, for those um, who are, um, who are um, um, vaccinated in March. By August, what we see here is that the Johnson & Johnson, not to panic anybody who has it, but the vaccine provided a 3% infectiveness against um, protection against uh, um, infection. Um, Pfizer is a little bit better, it was about 50%. Moderna was about 63%, um, I think, in this one. This was after, this was for March, and so this was about um, you know, five months afterwards. Um, and um, as I said, the George Mason policy says that if you were vaccinated by uh, with Johnson and Johnson sometime back in January or February, you're treated as fully vaccinated um, and um, uh, and um, no threat. So, um, and a lot of these vaccine mandates uh, do the same uh, same sort of thing. Um, what about durability? It's now pretty well established that. Um, it, uh, the, all the studies we have show at least 11 months of protection from natural immunity. Um, this is from a, a CDC IDSA clinician call. This is a, a series of, um, um, you can also find a lot of this in my Twitter feed um, if anybody wants to track down these, uh, these studies. But this was a call from July um, and what they reported here were several studies that found at least 11 months um, the only reason they said at least 11 months was because that was as far as the follow-up uh, follow uh, studies had gone at that point. Uh, so natural immunity was still going strong in 11 months, um, and it's now expected that it'll last, uh, provide substantial protection for at least a year or more. Um, and as uh, follow-up studies continue, they're finding that uh, natural immunity tends to provide pretty strong and durable protection. Um, the final point, of course, is that we've learned that the vaccines are much less effective against the Delta variant um, and variants generally. Um, there, it's uh, um, oddly enough, uh, the booster shots are continuing to use the now extinct original variant um, rather than the Delta variant. 
uh, which may end up having uh, problems of its own that we can talk about uh, later on. But what we see is that even at baseline, um, it's estimated that uh, the, uh, the vaccines are only about 66% um, uh, protective against the Delta variant rather than 91%. Uh, um, and this is a study that appears on the actual CDC website, MMWR. And so what we're talking about is not unsurprisingly, the vaccines themselves target a particular spike protein. Um, that spike protein is now extinct. Um, uh, that was the original alpha uh, variant. Um, and one of, and as we'll see, the the uh, the primary uh, uh, the primary reason why Delta seems to have spread so rapidly is precisely because it is effective. The the variants on the Delta um, uh, uh, vaccine, the Delta um, variant, are um, are are kind of perfected to to escape uh, vaccine immunity. Um, and uh, this was a case. This is a very interesting study from San Francisco while the rise of Delta was taking place. And what these researchers found was that, um, uh, that uh, while before Delta had taken over completely, what they found was that 78% of those who were infected um, with breakthrough vaccine breakthrough infections were infected with some variant of Delta, whereas 48% of those who were not vaccinated and were infected were, um, were uh, infected with, uh, with Delta. And so what we saw here was that um, those who are vaccinated are disproportionately uh, were disproportionately affected, uh, uh, infected with the Delta variant, passing on the Delta variant, um, and, uh, whereas um, the unvaccinated people were still there was more heterogeneity um, in more uh, genomic uh, um, variety in what uh, the unvaccinated people were being uh, infected with. And so basically, what we end up seeing here. Um, is that the the uh, in every country that has started mass vaccination, what we've seen is a rapid takeover by the Delta variant, uh, which um, this study suggests, um, in evolutionary biology suggests, is caused by the tendency for the vaccines to um, to select for variants that are effective at escaping the vaccines once we start to get this waning protection that we saw above. So the combination of waning protection Waning protection leads to infection. Infection um, tends to be with varieties that um, can uh, escape the vaccines, um, at which point then those um, are passed on. And in some cases, at least, uh, they add additional uh, variants that make it uh, still easier, more variants primarily on the spike protein that enable to, um, to, to escape um, vaccines. So, um, um, uh, and this is, um, uh, and, and so, and so, what we see is that natural immunity is more durable. Um, natural immunity is more resistant to variants, um, and uh, and this is a very interesting point because this is something that people don't generally understand. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this uh, this um, this variance, right? And what we see here is a study uh, that says our analysis demonstrates the broad diversity of T cell epitopes that have been recorded for SARS-CoV-2. A large majority are seemingly unaffected by current variants of uh, concern. And so the question is, why is it that natural immunity um, is so much more protective against variants than the vaccines are? Um, and this is a marvelous uh, study. You can find this as a pinned tweet on um, my, my Twitter feed. So a study by a site called CureHub. And what they did was they took apart um, and studied all the proteins and amino acids within um, uh, within uh, um, uh, uh, in, in sort of the neutralization for the various vaccines compared to natural infection here. Um, and what we see here is the first thing is a study of peptides with increased antibody uh, binding. And so what we see here is that um, the, the people down at the bottom, the light blue um, indicates that basically what you have here is a uh, is more uh, proteins and peptide sequences that show increased antibody binding after COVID-19 vaccination or natural uh, infection. This is a really neat study, but what we see here is much broader protection. And basically what this is telling you, as we all know now, natural immunity recognizes basically all of the proteins um, in the SARS-CoV-2 virus, whereas the vaccines only target the spike protein. Um, and so what this means is even if the spike protein varies, um, and thereby can escape the, uh, the vaccines. It doesn't escape natural immunity to the same extent. And this is a very good visualization 
of how that how that system operates. Um, and so what we have, um, uh, uh, and we have another chart here on this from the same study that shows the same sort of thing: count of unique SARS-CoV-2 peptide sequences from spike protein subunits S1 and S2 that uh, basically show again the breadth of uh, protection against uh, against variants. Um, this is the other big thing, which is the nucleocapsid, uh, which is, this is the sort of the, the general protein that carries all of the, uh, the small proteins. And what we see here, again, is natural infection has um, uh, basically recognizes the nucleocapsid um, uh, um, antibodies, right? And so the nucleocapsid um, basically is the way in which it recognizes the entire uh, SARS-CoV-2 vi uh, uh, virus um, protein um, and the full complement uh, rather than uh, individual type things such as the spike uh, spike protein. Um, and so, um, and, and then the final thing that we have um, that is the reason why natural immunity seems to be so much more protective than vaccines is what is called IgA antibodies and uh, mucosal immunity. Um, and so respiratory illnesses enter through the nose into the respiratory system. And the difference between, and these are some good studies that explain this, the difference between natural immunity and vaccines is natural immunity basically recognizes and begins fighting the, uh, the virus as soon as it hits the nose. This is what they call mucosal immunity or IgA antibodies. Whereas what we see and what these studies summarize is facts, the, the current generation of vaccines are intramuscular they're inserted into the the uh, the muscle, and so um, essentially they don't respond to the impetus of a uh, of um, of an infection until it actually hits your system. Um, and of course, one of the difference between Delta um, and the original virus is the original virus quickly migrated into the the lungs um, and the respiratory system, and so the vaccines would have been effective against that. Whereas the Delta variant sits in the nose and mouth much longer, including the type of symptoms people have reflect uh, reflect that. But basically, this is why the vaccines do not do a very effective job at preventing infection, um, is because the their protection isn't triggered until the uh, until the virus hits the uh, the respiratory system in the body, and so you get three, four, five days there uh, where it's sitting in your nose and your mouth. Um, and so this is why it turns out that vaccinated people can get infected, vaccinated people can transmit um, uh, infection, and vaccinated people can end up and frequently do have the same viral loads as unvaccinated people, because basically the, the uh, it can brew in your nose and your mouth um, for several days before the immune system kicks in. And then basically what you get after that is that's why the vaccines, in theory at least, protect you from serious illness is then the immune system boots up, uh, boots up faster. But this is why it's always been understood, even though it was misrepresented. I think if I think if the vaccine companies made representations about their vaccines that the public health community made for months on their benef uh, on their behalf, they would have probably violated the FTC Act uh, um, in the idea that they were, you know. And now basically, there's this more realistic sense that people are finally adjusting the idea that they provide primarily private protection, uh, which is potentially protection against serious illness um, and um, hospitalization and death, but that because of the nature of these vaccines, non-sterilizing, non-durable vaccines, they're of limited um, and short-term protection against uh, infection and transmission, which is of course the underlying important part of, uh, of understanding um, of, 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 of vaccine mandates, unlike other uh, vaccines. Um, so there's also antibodies. Uh, antibodies generated by natural immunity seem to, um, seem to be more flexible. They continue to evolve over time um, uh, and to recognize new variants uh, as well. Um, this is another uh, PIN study I have on my, um, on my, my Twitter feed if you're interested in uh, reading this. Um, and I just thought this would be interesting because a lot of people don't understand antibodies. And let me make it clear, antibodies are, not, uh, are quite obviously not the only aspect of, um, of immunity. Um, T cells and B cells are as well. Those are the memory cells. But antibodies are an easy way of determining whether somebody, um, you know, there's, there's pretty clear evidence now that antibody levels bear at least some correlation to your likelihood of getting infected. That's how they determine, for example, whether or not people should get a booster shot um, for, uh, for vaccines typically, or whether or not the initial dose of vaccines work because there's people who got full courts of vac vaccination and didn't, uh, didn't get anything. 
Um, so I thought this would be interesting. This is my antibody test that I got from LabCorp. If anybody thinks that they may have um, uh, contracted COVID and wanted to know, LabCorp provides something called the semi-quantitative semi -quantitative antibody test. And what we see here is the full complement of uh, vaccines. So IgM anti or, uh, antibodies, IgM antibodies, um, those are the short-term antibodies. Uh, they last about two weeks, and they're the initial things that boot up to, um, to attack the vaccine. So for, uh, I'm sorry, attack the virus. So I was originally infected in March, 2020. I was an early ad adopter of uh, COVID um, and had, you know, at the time I had um, uh, things that weren't considered symptoms um, and, um, and I couldn't get a test at the time because tests were very rare. That was within the first month of it appearing in the United States. But I was, they added to my symptoms later uh, in the spring. And so when I went back to teach, in July 2020, I got my first antibody test and it confirmed what I had thought, which I had natural immunity. I still had uh, antibodies. I've had several antibody tests since then. And then this past June, um, in anticipation of asking for my vaccine exemption um, or, or, uh, or, you know, eventually to ask George Mason really to recognize natural immunity, I got a full um, antibody test, uh, um, a semi-quantitative antibody test through LabCorp. And so we see here is IgM antibodies and short-term things. Those flare up and then disappear. And so what you can see is my reading was negative. But then IgG antibodies are the longer-term antibodies. So last for about a year in your system. And what you can see there is that my current result was positive. That's what we mean generally when we need a positive antibody test. Then you can look at the nucleocapsid, which I just mentioned ago. And what you see there is the explanation is that... Um, um, if you have a positive nucleocapsid antibodies test, that means you have antibodies from natural infection, whereas um, this is the recognition of the, 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 the sort of the protein shell uh, that, uh, um, that um, vaccinated people do not get, right? Uh, um, and so, uh, and so what, what you see here is uh, um, that this is the way you determine whether or not you have um, uh, contracted, um, confirm whether or not you have immunity from natural immunity versus um, versus um, uh, a vaccine. And then this was my actual semi-quantitative antibody test, which came in in June of this year at 715.6, uh, which as you can see, the baseline is 0 0.8. So my antibody levels was about 894 times baseline antibodies. And according to my immunologist, I was comparable to uh, somebody who um, who uh, uh, had just recently been vaccinated, and so this was the basis under which I made my claim that George Mason should recognize uh, recognize me as um, uh, being equivalent to somebody who had been vaccinated and have basically the same rules as uh, people who are vaccinated. But this is um, the actual quantitative level that could tell you how much your antibodies are, and so if you are out there and you're wondering whether or not you should get a booster and you're thinking about it, um, and if that's something you're interested in doing you can go and get your antibodies tested. Um, and if your antibodies still at a relatively high level, you're probably safe leaving aside um, the, uh, um, the, the variant uh, concern, but, uh, um, uh, but, uh, um, but, uh, but, you know, basically, but this will tell you sort of where you stand with things. Um, and, and, and this is, as we'll see, one of the reasons why it's unusually dangerous to vaccinate somebody like me who has an antibody level uh, at this high of a level at the current time because of the substantial risk of overinflaming the, um, the immune system would be like basically getting two shots of vaccine and then going out like next week and getting two more shots of vaccine uh, would provide very, very, very little benefit in a dramatically increased risk of overinflaming your immune system. Um, uh, and now the big issue, right? And so when vaccines are rolled out this spring, I think people expected that they were gonna last longer. Um, it's pretty clear that they, they haven't. Moderna, we could talk about it, it's last a little bit longer. This is from this spring. This was as early as May. This was from the leaked slideshow um, that the Washington Post got from the CDC. And what you said is, and what you see there is that even at that time, they were saying 35,000 symptomatic infections per week is what the CDC was estimating. So it's like 140,000 symptomatic infections per month back in, the, in May, and this is when vaccines were still relatively, um, relatively uh, early on. Um, uh, since we've seen waning, uh, and this is Vermont, this is what's going on in Vermont, um, which is Vermont is the most vaccinated state in the country. Um, and what you could see here is if, uh, you know, over the last week or two, Vermont has record high levels of um, infections. 
uh, in the most vaccinated uh, state in the country. Um, and unfortunately, hospitalizations have been rising um, uh, over time in um, Vermont as well, um, along with that. Uh, by contrast, since you're in Florida, um, as you know, you went through your period a few months ago when the media um, uh, was very upset about what was going on in August. And now you can compare Vermont uh, uh, to Florida uh, and see where Florida is uh, right now on that, on that curve. Um, uh, and what's going on here is primarily seasonality, uh, which is you guys moved indoor in August uh, and Vermonters are moving indoor now. And that's what spreads a lot of it. And it's really most transmission appears to occur in the house um, among family members with respect to this. Um, and this was Israeli data, um, uh, a very, you know, and, and Israel had um, very comprehensive uh, data reporting. And what we saw here, and again, this is what led to the panic at the CDC. This was um, uh, July. And what we saw in July was that um, uh, the, the overall impact was that if you take um, July 25th, July 31st, for example, you may have heard a lot about this, is that 86% of the, 84% um, uh, of the population was fully vaccinated and 86% of the cases uh, were among vaccinated people. That by this summer, there um, essentially was one-to-one, -one, that uh, the percentage of cases uh, that, that it appeared that the vaccines were providing almost no protection at all with respect to preventing an infection, which is again, what is required to uphold a, uh, a mandate. Um, uh, and um, it looks like I, um, see if I've got England here. Um, oh, and then the UK. Uh, and what we see in the UK, and this is just out of order, um, is if you've seen this data already, this is um, the, one of the, this is the latest report from the United Kingdom. And what we see now is UK effectively, you know, it's not completely controlled, um, has negative vaccine efficiency, eff efficacy against, um, against uh, infection now, uh, which is you see in every age group from 30 uh, and above, uh, the percentage of people, uh, the rate per 100,000 is higher for vaccinated than for unvaccinated people. And of course, unvaccinated presumably includes those with natural immunity. And it's not even clear that in the 18 to 29, that's the case, because there's reason to believe that um, there's a lot more testing going on in schools of unvaccinated people. And so they may just be under testing uh, with respect to 18 to 29. But even beyond that, what we see is for every age group above 30, um, there are more, a uh, higher percentage of vaccinated people are getting infected than unvaccinated people, um, uh, which suggests that the vaccines are doing little, if anything, an apparently negative impact on, um, on infections. Um, this is um, the best data we have with respect to um, a natural immunity reinfections. And recall, the CDC was estimating in May that there were 140,000 cases per month in the United States alone. According to this, um, according to this source, there have been 135,000 suspected cases of natural immunity reinfection in the entire world um, in the now, what, uh, 18, 19 months since the pandemic started. Um, uh, and so natural uh, immunity breakthrough infections appear to be very uh, rare and they're very mild where they generally happen. Um, uh, um, whereas breakthrough infection, uh, and they carry very uh, much lower viral load. And again, this seems to be because of this mucosal immunity uh, that immediately triggers up the immune system when it hits the, uh, um, the nose and mouth in, uh, in, in uh, people with natural immunity. Um, and this is an overall efficacy report. Um, so you find no relationship uh, worldwide between um, the rate of vaccination and the rate of uh, cases. So, um, uh, and this is of course the Israel case that kind of puts everything to, to rest. Um, let me just very, I'm, I'm going too long. So let me briefly try to wrap up. Um, there's a second aspect of this, which is important, and then we'll segue into the legal part, uh, which is that those who have natural immunity um, are at a much higher rate, uh, much higher risk of, um, of uh, adverse effects, including serious adverse effects from getting vaccinated post-recovery. Um, and so one study found that 6.8% of those who previously had COVID uh, recovered and then um, uh, were vaccinated uh, ended up um, with severe symptoms of required medical attention, meaning a visit to the emergency room or a hospitalization 
where none were found in the, uh, the infection naive population. Somewhere else they implied was 0 0.6 um, as opposed to 6.8. Uh, this is a study in JAMA that found four and a half higher, four and a half uh, times higher rates of, of um, systemic um, um, uh, adverse events if you were uh, um, vaccinated post uh, natural immunity. Um, uh, and again, this is all these studies that show that, um, uh, that there's not an elevated uh, risk compared to naive people. So let's close this up by talking about Buck versus Bell because Jacobson led to Buck versus Bell. Um, and Buck versus Bell was based on the cutting edge science of the time. The scientific consensus was um, eugenics. Um, and for those who know anything about Oliver Wendell Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes was a big uh, enthusiast of social Darwinism. Um, and so Buck versus Bell dealt with the Virginia law that allowed the forced sterilization of, uh, of people who are adjudged to be um, feeble-minded, um, which Carrie Buck was not, but, um, but they claimed she was. Um, she was basically a poorly educated Southern woman uh, who had been um, raped basically by, a, uh, by, the, by, uh, by the family she worked for. Um, and then they reported her basically um, uh, to, to shut her up. Um, and so what we see in um, uh, Buck versus Bell um, is a direct um, resting, uh, upholding this uh, Virginia law for sterilization based on the cutting edge uh, scientific consensus of the time. Um, and we've probably all heard this by now, the principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. And this is literally Oliver Wendell Holmes' um, uh, complete citation is, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, uh, which is that uh, Jacobson, he says, justifies forced sterilization of people because that's what the scientific authorities say. That's the scientific consensus um, that uh, uh, is eugenics. Um, uh, and properly, we have rebelled against that. Society was, uh, we've, we've come a long way since then. We understand medicine. We've got a different sense of ethics. And so since that time, what we've seen is a series of cases that have recognized bodily integrity a constitutional right to, uh, to bodily integrity. These are some of the, uh, some of the key, uh, key cases. Um, this is a case, um, uh, Washington versus Harper, right? And what we see in Washington versus Harper um, is that, uh, um, uh, that, that, you, that you, it was a forced treatment of somebody with antipsychotic drugs in jail, but that they have to show that it's both dangerous to himself or others, and that the treatment is in the inmate's medical interest. Um, and what we've just seen is that vaccination provides very little, if any, benefit to those who have natural immunity um, and has a seriously elevated risk of side effects. Anybody who says that I've not seen anybody try to net out the, um, the cost and uh, benefits and the risk reward uh, uh, with respect to that and come out and suggest that it makes sense. Um, this is cell versus United States. Only if the treatment is medically appropriate, is unlikely to have side effects and might undermine the fairness of the trial. And you have to take account of less uh, intrusive alternatives uh, and that it's necessary to further government trial-related interests. This is a case of basically giving antipsychotic drugs before you could stand trial. Skinner versus Oklahoma, 1992, right? Um, says that this was a case that uh, reviewed an another forced sterilization law and said, the problem here is, is once you do it, you can't undo it. Um, much like vaccinating somebody who is um, vaccinating anybody, but especially who's had uh, a natural immunity, um, and especially something like a kid uh, who uh, might have uh, natural immunity. Um, uh, this uh, very striking concurrence by Justice Jackson and Skinner said, um, there are limits to the extent to which a legislatively represented majority may conduct biological experiments at the expense of the dignity and personality and natural powers of a minority, even those who have been guilty of what the majority defines as crimes. Um, and this is yet uh, more stuff on this, right? So, so I think Jacobson says it has to be reasonable. These other cases say you've got to respect people's bodily integrity and the burden is on the state to show that it's necessary to vaccinate or to, to compel somebody to undergo medical treatment. Um, uh, and, and judges have to stand in the breach. Otherwise, we may as well be back in the world of Buck versus Bell. There's other problems here. The way in which these things have been rolled out, for example, at George Mason, our vaccine mandate was originally fired off by the president. Um, Jacobson makes pretty clear that there has to be a legislative authority uh, for that. Um, you know, University presidents, local school boards, 
Um, I've not seen any evidence that they have the right to force people to undergo medical um, medical uh, uh, treatments. Um, the other thing that's important uh, with this is under state law, state laws do not have vaccine mandates, although people seem to think they do. State laws have immunity mandates. Um, and this is Virginia law, for example, which is if you have um, natural immunity against a disease um, and you can prove it by a serological testing methods such as antibodies, then you don't have to get vaccinated against mumps, measles, rubella, varicella, whatever the uh, whatever the case may be. And yet now we're creating a brand new by um, by by executive fiat um, uh, um, vaccine requirement that does not recognize natural immunity, even though uh, the legislation in the state that uh, deals with every other type of uh, of uh, vaccine recognizes natural um, immunity. With respect to the OSHA rule, it has, it, it, if it ever comes out, this has problems of its own. Federal government does not have a police power. Um, the federal, uh, the OSHA um, wants to use this emergency temporary standards uh, rule, which says that the rule is, has to be necessary to protect employees against a grave danger from exposures to substances or agents to term be toxic or physically harmful or from new hazards. Um, that clearly does not apply to things like viruses. That applies to chemicals, uh, things like that. This has been a rarely used process that uh, um, President Biden claims he's going to use. It's only used nine times between 1971 and 1983. It was challenged six times and only one time was upheld. Um, it seems pretty clear that this is not the kind of thing that emergency temporary standards can be used for. They want to do it. They need to do notice and comment uh, uh, rulemaking. Um, uh, and this is the definition of toxic materials or harmful physical agents that they would be trying to, uh, to, to use, uh, which in no way seems to apply to vaccination. vaccination. So I will, I will close there, which is um, we can do better with this and judges need to do better. Judges need to just stop waving their hands at this um, um, because the Supreme Court makes it clear that you have a right to bodily integrity. The government uh, has to actually bear a burden of showing that this is necessary. Uh, that this is the least intrusive way of, uh, of, of doing it, um, and that this is a proper um, exercise of government power. And I don't think that it's a proper exercise of government power for local school boards or university presidents or anybody else to just make up vaccine mandates, not recognize natural immunity, uh, for example. Um, I think this, you know, the same template should apply to schools, for example, that want to clearly schools want to vaccinate kids. Uh, and require uh, vaccination against COVID for kids to go to school. But I think low risk groups such as kids in, uh, uh, in general um, uh, are, are run a lot of these same sorts of uh, questions. And I think it's time the judges took seriously what the Supreme Court has been saying for decades, which is we don't live in the Jacobson world and we don't live in the Buck versus Bell world anymore. We've got um, more enlightened ethics and more enlightened science and medicine. Um, and I think it's time that we started uh, uh, following that. So I will open up the questions now. All right, great. Well, first, uh, Professor Zawicki, let me thank you so much for that presentation. I saw you give some of that um, at the uh, Fetty Nights fight, and I've been using your data ever since uh, in my discussions with folks. Um, I, you know, my doctor, my doctor, my my primary care physician actually agrees uh, with your concerns about vaccinating the naturally immune, and, and he advised me not to get the vaccine myself. So um, I, I definitely relate with your um, your arguments and your conversations with others. So Great. let's take a look at some of these questions we have. Some of them, I believe you, you did answer with your data, but uh, if uh, you'd like to, to maybe touch on them again, uh, one of these questions we have, um, oh, that regards uh, what we're hearing about the, the vaccine, um, those who get uh, COVID after they've been vaccinated, uh, they have uh, lesser symptoms. So the, the question here is uh, asking, does your argument for natural immunity suggest the death rate per thousand is lower or the same as the death rate in those who are vaccinated? Uh, are, does, did your um, data show anything about that? Yeah, so that's a, so that's a good question. Let me, let me make clear that um, the, the, reason, the reason why I focus on here, um, infection and transmission is because that is the linchpin of a mandate. Um, if they, if 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 it's a if it's a therapeutic treatment that prevents that protects you from serious illness and death, that's a good thing, obviously. But that is primarily a private benefit um, to people, and so if that's what the effect is, it's not. It doesn't provide a valid legal basis for a mandate. 
Um, the only basis for mandate is infection um, and uh, transmission, which is why I focused on that in my remarks here. Um, uh, and so I have not looked as closely at the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the death, the um, hospitalization and death rates. It seems that um, as far as we can tell right now with respect to death, um, that uh, um, it does provide uh, protection against, uh, protection against uh, a death. Um, again, most people who die are very, very ill and very, very old. Um, and, so, um, and so there is kind of a sense where at the margin, if you're, you know, if you're 80 years old and have four comorbidities, um, that could make the difference uh, for, for other people um, from what we can tell. They're very low risk of uh, very low risk of death unless you've got multiple comorbidities or immunocompromised type situation. Uh, but based on what we know, it still does prevent against uh, against death uh, for for those who, um, who who get it. But I have not looked at that data as closely as this data uh, here because that's more of a private decision uh, for people. Okay. Uh, another question uh, we have is uh, how. Regarding the antibody test, uh, is that the only way to determine natural immunity or uh, you mentioned T cell immunity or cell mediated immunity? Is there a way of testing for that? There is. Um, and, and I've not done done T cell test yet because my immunity level, my antibody level has been so high. I haven't felt like I needed to do the, uh, the, the T cell test, but there is something called T cell detect. Um, I, I've not talked to anybody who's actually done it um, uh, to, to determine what you get from it. And I haven't seen one. So if anybody's actually done that, I would love to hear from you. But there are ways to, uh, to, um, to, to test for T cells. And T cells and B cells, of course, turn out to be the memory cells that generate new antibodies. And so that's what really is going to matter for the long run with respect to, um, to long-term protection as well as uh, you know, the broader uh, protection you get from natural immunity, nucleocapsid um, protection um, uh, in the broader array of, um, of, um, of uh, proteins uh, against which uh, natural immunity protects. Okay, uh, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about your case that you had. Um, yeah. Procedurally, how, how did that resolve itself? Uh, you know, how, how did, what, what, what kind of a resolution did you get out of that? Great, thanks, uh, Chad. That's a great question. So, what ended up happening in the case was um, uh, um, when I realized that George Mason was going to roll this out, um, I contacted the university. I con uh, first I contacted them privately, and I said, "Do you plan to do anything about uh, considering natural immunity?" And the mid-level bureaucrats in the university um, wrote back with some hogwash about about this. And this is one of the things that's maddening, Chad. That's just really kind of insane about, uh, about I mean, literally insane about how we're doing this, which is we have mid-level human resources bureaucrats and corporate bureaucracies to, uh, overruling people's doctor's recommendations <laughs> about whether or not they should get vaccinated. I, and, you know, my, my immunologist is, you know, uh, um, a PhD, MD, PhD immunologist. He's published over 65 medical journal articles. He taught at the Harvard uh, Hospital and Penn Hospital. And I have to get a permission slip from George Mason not to get vaccinated, even though my, you know, my, my, tr my trained immunologist tells me it's dangerous uh, for me to do it. We've got HR bureaucrats. In these corporations, 20, one of my former students is working someplace, some 27-year-old mid-level HR bureaucrat decided that he did not have a legitimate religious exemption. <laughs> so it's like, how, what, what is this? What world are we living in in which we have HR bureaucrats deciding whether or not you're allowed to follow your doctor's recommendation about a medical treatment or your, or your, your religious um, beliefs? It's I mean, to step back and think about it, it's, uh, it, it's crazy. So in my case, um, the people who are designing the policy at George Mason are the university fire chief um, and the um, person who's in charge of lab safety at George Mason because they put it under the heading of, um, of basically safety uh, of, uh, in that sort of thing at campus. So I sent them a letter, they brushed me off. Um, I sent, or sent an email, I sent an, a letter, private letter, represented by my lawyers, the New Civil Liberties Alliance, um, who have been handling uh, these cases. I attached two medical affidavits. They brushed that off and just released the policy. So at that point, I sued. Um, and as part of uh, 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 getting standing and having the case be ripe, I had to request a medical exemption. Um, they gave me a medical exemption on some uh, elements unique to my, um, my personal health condition. 
um, that basically identified me as being at a higher risk, which is actually true, uh, which is that I'm at a, for various personal reasons, I'm an elevated risk of, um, of uh, adverse reactions to the, uh, to the vaccine. And so they gave me a personal um, exemption and then I was still going to pursue the case, but then at that point they changed the rules. Originally, if you were vaccinated, you wouldn't have to wear a mask, and you wouldn't have to be um, tested. Where I was, would have had to wear a mask, be tested, and engage in social distancing. They changed the rules uh, so that now everybody has to wear a mask at George Mason, whether vaccinated or not. I have to get tested more frequently, but uh, but that's really the only difference um, as far as I'm concerned. And it's a non-invasive test. So at that point, I dropped the uh, the lawsuit, but. Fortunately, a lot of other cases have been follow-on cases around the country. Um, in particular, uh, Dr. Um, Aaron Cariotti um, at UC Irvine brought a similar case uh, um, and in, um, that is proceeding uh, through the courts. And a lot of these cases are currently percolating for people who haven't got um, a, a, um, uh, a medical exemption like I did. Well, along those lines, uh, here's another question we have regarding judicial cowardice. Uh, what you know, what is it going to take at this point? Uh, is it, or do we just need to wait for these cases to work their way through? Uh, you know, lots of people are losing their jobs in the meantime, uh, or risking themselves to uh, you know to getting unnecessary vaccines. Uh, what what do you think explains for for um, you know how long this seems to be taking? I, I don't know. And from what I can tell, when you read the cases, um, the judges just generally seem to be confused, um, which is that there are some judges who have recognized, uh, as, as we know, there are cases that recognize um, the necessity for, for legitimate religious exemptions. Um, and that seems to be on the basis that you've got strict scrutiny um, and that you have to um, show that um, a compelling reason to force somebody to uh, undergo medical treatment against their religious beliefs. And, and that's correct, I think. Um, um, what judges have failed to recognize is that Jacobson is not an island, um, that it's precisely because Jacobson led to these abominable cases like Buck versus Bell that we don't want to, we don't live in that world anymore, and we don't want to live in that world anymore. And so judges have failed to recognize this importance of um, uh, a recognition of a right to bodily integrity. And I skipped over one of the cases. This goes back at least to 1891, uh, where they basically said the, gov the government has to have a good reason, a compelling reason to force you to undergo uh, a medical uh, a treatment. And so I think it's just a matter of judges recognizing that there are these two lines of cases, this archaic, it's not even a line of case, it's just like this old archaic Jacobson case, which has an archaic view of medicine and the relationship of the citizen to the state, um, you know, uh, and a very serious thing, which is smallpox vaccine. But then this more recent line of cases that recognizes that, uh, the importance of having a right to bodily integrity. And because we haven't had a pandemic really in over a century, I think the, those cases, like lines of cases just haven't been reconciled. And so I think it's time for judges to recognize that these are two equally valid lines of cases and that Jacobs himself has limits built into it. It's just not anything goes. Uh, and these subsequent cases have uh, basically created a muscular respect for the idea that people have individual rights uh, and individual bodily integrity. And I think that's why it's time for judges to step up and start recognizing that just as you have a right to uh, religious liberty, you have a right to bodily integrity and not be uh, required to undergo unnecessary medical procedures that expose you to a high degree of risk. Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up now. Um, we have had a few other questions asking for um, the PowerPoint presentation. You mentioned you'd, you'd get that to us. I'll make sure to get that out to everybody who's attended. Um, and if you have any other resources you'd like to point them in that direction, uh, this this has been recorded. It may be posted at a later date. So uh, I'll also let everybody know if they'd like to revisit this. But thank you so much. Uh, this was invaluable. We really appreciate uh, you joining us today. Wonderful. And if you want to find a lot of the studies there on, uh, you can find them on my complaint at the New Civil Liberties Alliance in a subsequent case of Norris versus Michigan State that has updated data on that. And then on my Twitter feed, I'm kind of constantly updating as new evidence comes out uh, in the in the like. So, um, so if this is something you're interested in, you can check out those two sources. Uh, thanks, Chad. Thanks everybody for your attention today. I enjoyed talking with you. Yes, thank, thanks again. And that concludes our event. We look forward to uh, hosting our next event uh, in the next uh, the coming months. So keep uh, looking at both the website and your emails for more information on that. Thank you very much and have a great day.